you so many today. Um, as Lindsay said, I'm, I'm fortunate to work at the New Hampshire Coalition for 21 years. Um, I've been managing a variety of different funding sources here. In 1993, when I started, the coalition budget was about $100,000 or so in change. There was four staff, including me, and at the time we managed approximately seven grants, four of which were passed through to our member programs. Um, at the time we had, I think, 12 member programs. We now have 14. Soon they become 13 member programs because uh, two are merging. So I'm not sure what the total agency budget was then, but it was definitely under a million. And now our coalition budget is 4.7 million. The coalition office total agency budget is 1.5 million. We have 16 staff. I'm managing 20 grants, seven of which are passed through to members. Uh, we have one other fiscal person who is almost full time. I also oversee two statewide databases, a victim services database and an education and outreach database. When I say statewide, these databases are used by all of our member programs for reporting to funders, including the coalition. I also oversee our office information technology, um, the facilities here in Concord, New Hampshire, and I share human resources responsibilities with our executive director. I supervise two staff, our office coordinator, and the um, bookkeeper and data specialist that I mentioned previously. So most of what uh, we'll talk about today is related to federal funds. We'll spend a good amount of time on specific resources, procedures, and policies that you can use once implemented to help sustain your organization, your coalition. Um, after each section, as Lindsay said earlier, we're going to pause to answer any questions that you might have put up into the chat. Um, we're hoping there'll be time at the end of the webinar to open up um, the unmute so that all voices can be heard and you can ask questions of me directly. Uh, first, we're going to discuss financial legal requirements as it relates to management of federal funds. We'll talk about internal controls, what they are, their purpose and preparing your board for accomplishment of their fiduciary responsibilities. We'll also discuss managing grants, what's needed to be in place in order to receive federal grants. We'll talk about budgeting best practices, cost allocation methods, and financial reporting. And finally, we'll talk about the difference between an audit and a financial review, and some specifics that you can look for in the language in an audit. I'm going to give you a lot of information today, and some of it may be quite familiar. You may be quite familiar with it already. Some may be new. If you feel yourself getting overwhelmed, take a deep breath. I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm a little nervous. Uh, it takes time for an organization to build financial systems or revise or update your systems. If you're able to say to yourself, I'll start or a plan to use one item from what I learned today this week or soon, it's really going to be a success for your organization. Um, I'm a finance and grant manager and realize maybe you're not, so if I can help explain or define terms, um, items, just please let me know. Finance is usually a very concrete topic, and we want to give you some best practices here, but we also understand that not all best practices, financial best practices, are really practical for every nonprofit, and you know, I'll try to talk about that a little bit. Uh, I did provide many handouts, and one handout is uh, I think it's called, What are the Legal Responsibilities and Fiduciary Duties of Nonprofit Boards? Um, it goes into detail the uh, duty of care, the duty of loyalty, and the duty of obedience, and how those duties are enacted to oversee the finances of the coalition by the board. Um, we're not going to go into detail with that today. There is a webinar in two weeks from now. Well, we'd be talking more about board um, responsibilities and whatnot. Uh, but did want to have share with you this slide, which is uh, sort of the specifics of staff and board responsibility. One thing that uh, we've seen over the years is, you know, assisting boards not to be, not to micromanage, for them to be careful not to get into the specifics of daily operations. Um, there are exceptions to that if there's a vacancy in senior leadership or uh, a board member where a board member might need to provide, say, supervision or decision making uh, because the, basically f the f board's fiduciary responsibility um, is oversight and to understand the policies and procedures that essentially you know, staff help to create. 
Um, so as staff, primarily it's our job to support the board. Um, specifically, if you have a finance committee, you know, we support the finance committee in reviewing monthly financials and preparing themselves for the audit and, and other items. Let's see. So uh, specifically some management responsibilities and how this slide delineates from the last is uh, talking about the staff making sure that they are providing financial reporting timely and, com and complete reporting both for the ED and for the board. Um, the staff, as I said earlier, drafting procedures and policies that are the code of conduct or otherwise known as the internal controls of the agency, providing information that will help the board when the board might be engaging in strategic discussions or planning uh, um, and that may impact the financial future of the organization. So I wanted to define for you, if possible, which I, I think I might be able to do, internal controls. And essentially, um, an internal control is the written policy or procedure of what good financial management is. And that's what the staff and the board will be using to guide the organization. I wanted to give you two caveats before I go a little further into internal controls, and that is to say that the New Hampshire Coalition's documents, some of the handouts that I provided today, haven't been updated to reflect the changes that the office, the Federal Office Management and Budget have made regarding the code of federal sorry, regulations. People know those also as the circulars, A133, A122, et cetera. So as I said, the federal government has updated that. Now it's commonly referred to as the uniform guidance. But our, some of our handouts, handouts have not been updated to reflect that. So throughout the handouts, you might see our audit referred to as A133. I'll talk about that a little later. So we'll be updating both um, the handouts and our fiscal manual um, to reflect the changes that are coalition has been impacted by the change to the code of federal regulations. And we will also be updating our fiscal manual um, because we uh, enacted a per diem travel policy and we're also using a lot of electronic fund transfers for payroll and our um, payables and whatnot. And anyway, getting back to internal controls. Um, generally, internal controls allow an agency to segregate their duties so that if you have uh, an executive director and a finance staff person, those people wouldn't be doing the same things or have necessarily the same uh, responsibilities and, and tasks. With internal controls, as far as the design of them, usually that's management, designing the policies and procedures. Um, the staff's responsibility is to implement and carry out uh, those written policies and procedures consistently. And the board would approve and monitor the internal controls, uh, maybe monitor on a regular basis. And also the auditors are going to check your internal controls to see that they're consistent with policy and generally accepted accounting principles. The internal controls for an agency can be difficult when a coalition specifically might be very small. If the coalition may only have five or six staff and, uh, and outside bookkeepers employed, for instance, it, and the executive director is doing a lot, you know, maybe even um, opening mail and you know, depositing checks and, and whatnot. And so if, even if you have another person that you can use in the agency, such as an office coordinator or um, just somebody else other than the person who's opening the mail, um, then you're able to sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Allow for a written policy that doesn't have just one person managing and um, you know, overseeing the finances. So uh, a good example might be that um, you have a bookkeeper who is did not approve in the expenses, the executive director is approving the expenses, um, and that, that bookkeeper can't sign the checks as well. Only the executive director would sign the checks, but the bookkeeper would be the one that would be um, producing them. Um, some folks find that limiting the amount of a check is helpful, 
for the New Hampshire Coalition, we find it's not particularly practical because, as I said, we're a pass-through to our 14 member programs. That's about $3 million, so any particular quarter's reimbursement to our members, there might be a check that's $60,000. So limiting checks, we found, doesn't really work with us for us. Other possible internal controls in reference to writing and approving checks would be that there might be a second uh, signator uh, besides the executive director. Another internal control would be that the executive director does not approve his or her own costs. Um, that there are, are uh, the board reviews the executive director's uh, reimbursements and timesheets and signs off on those. Uh, there are some more specific examples of internal controls in our fiscal manual. Um, and so I think we can move on to some generalities on what you want to pay attention to uh, in regards to things that you want to know. For your state, you may have an Attorney General's Office, Department of Revenue, Secretary of State that has the authority over charitable organizations. Uh, we have um, a charitable trust division of our Attorney General's Office, and we have rules and regulations from them that we have to follow. So you want to make sure you find out who that is if you don't already know who it is and what sort of rules and regulations there are. Um, if you have a finance committee, and if you don't, I suggest that you and your board create one. Um, one of the things that would be in a fiscal manual or part of your internal controls would be written out, how often the Finance Committee might meet, um, if what, what they will see in terms of reports. Um, typically, the Finance Committee might actually maintain and update the fiscal manual, so that would also be written up. Uh, and again, if you have a fiscal manual, what those policies are that are in there. The policies that I recommend every State Coalition have and is maintained in a fiscal manual are an agency conflict of interest. And there are examples in our fiscal manual um, to see what that looks like. The best practice as far as a conflict of interest policy is not only just to have every board and staff member review and sign them for staff on, upon employment and for board members upon when they are elected to the board but also to make sure that that's done annually so that if there's any particular um, issues that those are made known to the board and, and management. Also, a whistleblower policy um, is recommended, and that essentially ensures that if staff reports something to management or to the board, such as perhaps potential fraud um, or another maybe breach of contract of some sort, that they won't be fired for that report. Uh, another policy that's important to have is your record retention policy. It details the financial or personal records that the agency holds and how they will be retained and for how long. Um, additionally, you might have uh, or you might employ a financial management calendar. There may be software that your agency has for that. Um, we actually just use an Outlook calendar and it's uh, we put things on it such as when our payroll taxes are due, if we have any state uh, taxes or, as I said before, you know, state um, sort of charitable um, filings that need to be done. I even put things down there such as a staff evaluation that I need to perform. Or uh, we also have our conflict of interest um, statement requirement annually on there. Um, helpful if you're at least your treasurer or your board clerk knows in your agency where your legal documents are, perhaps has copies of them, or you, if you have a secure site uh, piece, it's not site, but um, section on your website that the board members can have access to, um, we recommend that. So financial resources that are good for uh, your agency to have both staff and board on hand and easily able to get. Um, are the uh, agency's fiscal manual. And one of the things that I wanted to say to folks is when I, when I started this work, it was really difficult, I thought, to find peers that could help me with policies, procedures, you know, just how to do certain things in nonprofit accounting. 
And I would say as of maybe 10 years ago, it's become much easier to find resources that are helpful and such as you know, webinars like folks may have attended a couple weeks back or maybe it was almost a month ago on the new uniform guidance that I was talking about that uh, I think it was Ellen Yin Weinkoff um, helped uh, present. So the resource sharing project of the National Alliance for Sexual Violence, I think if I said that right, and the National Network to End Domestic Violence have so many resources available to us. And so it's, it's just great that we have that, that we can look towards. But for your agency specific, if you have a fiscal manual or even just a few of those internal controls, I want to make sure everybody knows how to find them and can refer to them. Uh, if you have narratives ongoing throughout the year regarding what has been happening with you know, grant increases or uh, programmatic changes in grants, uh, that's really helpful for people to see. Your approved budget is something that everyone should have access to. The, um, any kind of audit or financial review that your agency may have done in previous years past, and the most recent one obviously is going to be the most pertinent. And also the IRS Form 990. Uh, the 990 is used by tax-exempt organizations, which I believe all coalitions are, um, and provides the IRS with financial data on your organization. Um, it's available for public inspection. Um, oftentimes, I, I think now it's just the rigor that it's up on GuideStar, I'm not sure. But the, it's how the public perceives your organization and how the information is presented on it is how the public's going to you know, look at it. So it's advisable to make sure that your 990 is accurate, and it fully describes your organization's programs and accomplishments. Uh, I recommend that your finance committee reviews it before it, it is um, presented to, or not presented, but submitted to the IRS. Um, it's going to tell anyone who's interested in a line-by-line -line fashion um, what those audited financial statements really mean and what the agency's bottom line is. Back in 2009, the 990 was revised so that it was more of a, a fiscal governance integrity tool. And it started asking such questions as whether or not the agency has a whistleblower policy. Um, are there any conflicting relationships? Hence the reason to have a, a conflict of interest statement. Um, does the agency document meeting minutes? Um, were there any changes to the organization's bylaws over the last year? how the organization determines its top management compensation. So it's really become a tool for a lot of other folks who are interested in us charitable organizations um, to see you know, what we look like financially. Uh, this slide, it, it details our particular fiscal manual. Um, and I think the resource sharing project actually used our fiscal manual in one of or more of their resources. I know that when SASPA, the Sexual Assault Services Program of the Violence Against Women Act was enacted, some state coalitions hadn't been a pass-through. Um, so uh, they used part of our the subcontracting policies, I think, to help uh, folks. So that's in there if you are a, a subcontractor. Um, but in terms of the sections of the fiscal manual, the uh, first section would tell you know, what the treasurer of the board would perform and how often, if you have a finance committee, what their duties are, if you have an audit committee, how often they would meet and what their duties are, how often reports are produced to the finance committee and to the board, what the annual audit requirements are, like I said, if there's a 990 review policy. Uh, the budgeting process section would be um, when is that budget information provided to the board, what is your budget basis, is it on, based upon the mission, priorities, long-term plans, if there are any budget changes rules. Accounting system is really quite a catch-all for such things as if you have accounting software, what it is, uh, double entry system, um, if you have payroll, if it's treated within the organization or um, in, in outside of the, of the organization, petty cash and whatnot. Um, the fiscal, the financial practice would be those internal controls that we talked about, cash receipts, how that's received and, and treated, um, reconciling bank statements, reserve policies if you have any, subcontracting policies, expense reimbursements, and the like. Um, that actually is 
the end of our first section, financial legal requirements and internal controls. Um, Lindsay, do you know if we have any questions? It doesn't look like we have any questions, and just a reminder to the folks on the phone, since we had several people join a little later, uh, you are muted, so if you would like to um, make a comment or ask a question, press star six to mute. However, we do ask that um, uh, we prefer that you put your question in the chat box so that um, when Pamela stops, then we can um, field questions in this way. So, uh, so far, it doesn't look like we have any questions in the chat box. I'll give folks a second to maybe press star six to unmute themselves, but otherwise we'll keep going, Pamela. All right. So uh, the next section is just a little bit on grants management. I mentioned earlier that um, the Office of Management and Budget um, revised their uh, reformed and actually revised and strengthened the federal grant management guidelines and what they did was they combined circulars and the guidelines so that now it's it's essentially um, two chapters one and two of the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, Pam, I'm just going to stop you for a second. There's been yeah. a request to speak up a little, um, a little oh, louder, okay. so um, that might see. be helpful. In okay, so let me, I've, I've turned up my volume and I've tried to move my headset a little bit closer to my, um, to my, to my voice. Perfect, so much better. Is that better? Okay, thank you. Um, so what it did was it combined all of the circulars into this one one document. And so it combined the circulars for administrative requirements um, and the circulars for cost principles and for um, audit requirements and audit follow-up. So you want to make sure that um, senior staff understands the requirements of each federal contract, including the um, uniform guidance, and that they can inform the board of directors of those requirements should there be an inquiry. Um, one of the ways I recommend that the staff does this is actually re were, sorry, reading every word of any grant application and any grant award terms. You know, the uniform guidance is, is uh, overall financial management for federal awards, but each grant will have its own specific um, allowable costs and, and et cetera. So I recommend that. Um, OVW and also, and uh, when I say OVW, that stands for the Office of Violence Against Women, um, and also the Administration for Children and Families, which is the agency that manages our uh, Family Violence Prevention Services Act, FIPSA coalition grants. Um, they have, and they are required to have, a long list of administrative and national uh, policy requirements that we need to adhere to. So um, understanding what's involved in the, um, the circulars is, is helpful. Not the circulars, sorry, the uniform guidance. Uh, one of the things that we've noted of late, and I can't remember when this particular requirement was enacted, but what it, the civil rights compliance is about is some recipients of grants from the United States Department of Justice, so that's going to be um, Victims of Crime Act and any VAWA grant. Uh, there's a, administrative provisions from the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act of 1968 to create and keep on file and submit to the Office for the Civil Rights for review and implementation of an equal opportunity plan. Now, I think most coalitions are actually exempt from that plan because you don't have um, 50 employees or more, and there are other exemptions that you can look into. I'm pretty sure on the resources slide at the end of this, there is a, a link to, to this um, issue. But, but even if you are exempt from providing a plan, um, you need to complete a certification form and submit that to the Office of civil rights for their review. And this actually should be done each time um, one of these awards is received. So if you are, uh, if your coalition uh, might receive VAWA Rural or uh, any other discretionary grant, um, grants to encourage arrest, any of those, um, pretty sure you need to fill out that certification form each time and submit it. Also, all coalitions are receiving uh, grants to state coalitions and, and to the tribes, and we're required to acknowledge that we've received the notice, 
that um, grantees and subgrantees must comply with the confidentiality and privacy protections of VAWA. That form is available on the OBW website. Other important things to know regarding grant, grants management is if your organization is expending any funds for federal lobbying activities, there is a form that you need to complete and provide to OVW. Here in New Hampshire, uh, we're required by state law to keep separate bank accounts to handle our lobbying wages. And so uh, subsequently, we know uh, in any given week what our lobbying wages are for our New Hampshire-specific activities. Um, regarding our payroll. So hopefully other, other states don't have such an onerous um, requirement. Uh, as I mentioned before, we've got reporting requirements for all grants for the um, OVW, uh, State Coalitions Grant. You'll be reporting in the Grants Management System, otherwise known as GMS. There'll be quarterly federal financial reports um, that are due in GMS, and there's also uh, semi-annual performance reports that are submitted into GMS. Uh, for your FIPSA coalition grant, you'll use the, um, gosh, I can't think, oh, the Payment Management System, and, and everyone has to just love that acronym of PMS, um, but both your um, financial reporting and if you're requesting reimbursement funds um, are submitted onto that federal site. Um, in terms of um, sort of managing those, it's really helpful if the passwords are written down that the executive director and the finance staff can have access to those. Those passwords change on a regular basis or required to be changed. Um, so making sure that people have access to those um, is important. I, I think most people know about their DUNS number. Uh, again, having that handy, having most staff know about it. Uh, where it is or what it is, and board as well. Um, and then there's a system for award management that when you're applying for any federal grant, uh, you need to make sure that your annual registration in that system is um, kept up to date. And that's another thing that we would put on our uh, grants management calendar to ensure that we're, we're um, doing that every year. I think I mentioned. Uh, we recommend staff read all the requirements in a grant application and then also um, read the fine print in the award to make sure that it's something that your coalition can comply with. Uh, we actually keep separate files, both electronic and paper, on, on each separate grant. So even if we have, even if the coalition grants are overlapping, um, we're able to separate it and, and keep, keep it clear in our own systems. Um, we ensure that staff that are being paid for or are part of any deliverables understand what those are. Um, we, as I said, we keep that grants management, oh, we keep a financial management and grants management calendar. They're actually kept together. So it would have, I as soon as we receive a grant, we put in this calendar what the reporting schedule is for the grant, any work plan delivery dates, uh, we put, as I said, the annual registration for SAM or any state annual registration that we might have. Um, and uh, we combine them, the two of them. There's also some software out there that I think some folks might have that um, they could avail themselves to. But for us, it's, uh, as I said, just an Outlook calendar. Um, you want to make sure that you assign who's responsible for what because you've got grant application writing, you've got submission, um, you have the budgeting part of that, uh, the grant reporting. Um, a, a tip I say is to always check your junk mail because it's interesting what I find in my junk mail, which is literally notification of an award from some federal funder. So I actually check my junk mail if I can every day. Uh, we have um, a system, and I, I can't remember the coalition that we got it from, so I apologize for not being able to give them kudos, but we, we actually use an Excel uh, spreadsheet for tracking outcomes. Um, used to be in our executive director's head, so that when it time, came time to produce the semi-annual reports and annual reports, she didn't have a problem writing them, but once she left, um, we found challenge to get you know, substantive mm, outcomes um, and the ability to be able to get those reports written quickly. 
So we have an Excel spreadsheet that has four tabs on it, and this way we're able to have staff uh, note as they are doing any activities um, what it is. So for, we have four tabs. One is training and, and technical assistance. So any trainings that are provided, it's, it's notated in there of how many people were trained and who they were. The other tabs are systems advocacy, administration, and then the fourth tab is community awareness and outreach. Uh, we keep it for 18 months. Um, we add to it when a new grant is received, and then we sort of time that out and start a new one. Um, so. uh, I think that's the end of our grants management section. I don't know. I don't see any questions. Lindsay, do you? I do not, so um, feel free to keep going. And again, a reminder to all of the participants on the line, if uh, you have any questions, please feel free to, um, or we prefer that you put them in the chat box. Um, I know that we're having some technical difficulties with iLink, so if you're not online um, and you do have a question, um, I guess we'll pause for a moment and you can press star six to unmute yourself and ask a question there. Alternatively, you can also email me at l l or l m m at nnedv.org. Um, we do have a question that just came up. So um, Pamela, do you have an example of a tracking outcome Excel or access spreadsheet that you can share? I do. I'll make sure that Lindsay has that and that she can send it out to you. Great. So for the participants um, on the line, what I'll do, um, for those of you that registered ahead of time, um, I sent out a, a package of um, handouts that Pamela provided, and then I will add that to the um, package of handouts and send that out once more to everybody that registered and attended. All right. Do you think you can hear me better? I do. Okay. Great. So let's talk a little bit about budgeting and reporting. Um, I, I'm going to talk in general about the total agency budget, talk specifically about some costs, and also talk a little bit about actually grant management, or grant budgets rather. Um, one of the handouts that I provided, uh, let's see, I think it's called nonprofit. Let's see, um, know your nonprofit's financial strengths and weaknesses. Um, I believe that this is most helpful in a strategic plan type setting, but it could be for a. Uh, a new executive director, if there was a tool like this that had been done in the past for them to look at, uh, it's certainly an exercise that's designed to help provide um, a data-driven assessment over the organization's financial health. Um, and I do believe that it, it would help you in preparing your annual budget in, in a big picture way. Um, and I encourage you as senior staff board treasurers and executive directors to consider yourselves as the um, budget expert. Um, you know, even if you're a new executive director, you're learning very quickly all about your agency, and you are the person who's going to have the best overall sense of the organization. Uh, you know, if you've got senior staff that have been there for a while, they also are going to be able to help you in that regard. Um, but another handout that I also provided was uh, the 10-step annual budgeting checklist, and it is designed to give you some real concrete specifics on what to make sure you're doing uh, in reference to, you know, the budget approach, um, your timeline, um, understanding, or you're developing your expenses and your, your income, um, so I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, if you're an executive director who doesn't have a finance background, I encourage you to learn some accounting principles uh, and ask your finance staff who are hopefully presenting you with monthly reports to understand that. In terms of some accounting principles, you know, what is a journal voucher and what is its purpose? Uh, what's the difference between unrestricted and temporarily restricted net assets? Why is a grant a receivable, and when is it booked as cash? So um, there may be some local resources that you know that you could um, find yourself, you could avail yourself of uh, to do that. But I encourage you to just get a real basic sense of what some of those uh, accounting terms and uh, principles are. And 
you know, the administrative costs of the agency, you can use past history and budgets that can help you um, learn what those are, and uh, we can talk some more about, we are going to talk more about those um, and al allocating costs later. Uh, hopefully you've got some accounting software. QuickBooks works well for a lot of folks. Um, we actually have used for years um, what is known as MIP. It's uh, currently owned by a software company called Abila, A-B-I-L-A, and it is a true fund accounting program. Um, we find it's extremely helpful because we, as I said, manage multiple grants, and within those grants, there are multiple programs, and then we also have subcontracted uh, within those grants, and then within the subcontracts, there might be um, some separate uh, financing. So fund accounting program to that ilk works pretty well for us. And uh, I also recommend that the executive director is reviewing at least monthly um, revenue and expense reports. Um, So in terms of the annual budget, you can't start too early. I know that's sometimes difficult because we don't know what a lot of our um, grants or you know, what our projected fundraising might be if we're doing that. But uh, when preparing it, at least three months ahead of time, um, we have a policy that says that we actually present it to our board three months prior to our fiscal year. Uh, we actually, thankfully, receive lots of email updates from our national advocacy folks like NNEDV and the Resource Sharing Project, National Alliance for Sexual Violence, and this really helps us when we're looking at you know, some of these written assumptions that we've talked about. Um, we look at our budget versus actual reports when we are analyzing what we think the upcoming budget year will be like. In terms of a written assumption, uh, aside from what we think, you know, our increase in VOCA might be, right? Um, we would look at if we had, say, for instance, a three-year grant, um, and this upcoming year is the third year, what our revenue amount would be. If we've got changes maybe in our state unemployment tax rate, because unfortunately we might have had some claims made. Anything like that that you know, you want to make sure you write down in a narrative that is presented to uh, your finance committee and to the board when they're looking at the budget. Understanding each line item is important, where the money comes from, what it's for. Um, again, that helps you become the budget expert. And working with your accountant or bookkeeper, uh, your finance committee, um, to create the annual budget and break it down into a monthly um, budget so that you can uh, create cash flow forecasts and make monthly reporting much easier. So uh, as I said, the Finance Committee should review all the budget drafts. Right now our Finance Committee um, tomorrow night will be reviewing our third draft, and the first draft that the Finance Committee looked at was in February. Um, our Finance Committee is very uh, active, and I believe that they have a unique perspective over staff. They, they offer questions and they offer solutions that really assist us, um, so I, I really appreciate having a Finance Committee. Uh, Another handout was a grant budget breakdown that I provided, and that can help you at times, I think, even with your total agency budget, um, looking at you know, specifics that a particular grant might pay for may inform um, a, a piece of expenses in your, um, in your total agency budget. But also, if you're in a jam and you need to um, come up with a budget quickly, quickly for a grant that's due in a couple of days, I think that this checklist is also can be very helpful. Um, and when you're reviewing the total agency budget, uh, actually I already said that, so I apologize. Um, one of the things that the New Hampshire Coalition has done for years is we've actually used a budgeted increase of whatever the board decided even though our, for the salaries, I'm sorry, for salary increases, even though the salary increases are not cost of living, it's based upon here um, merit. And at least then w the organization has the ability to award those um, salary increases based upon merit um, and it's in budgeted. So I think it's good for the finance committee to ask questions about that if it's not evident in the narrative that's provided. Uh, one of the things that we've looked at in uh, tribal organizations over the last, 
don't know, maybe five or six years more carefully is really being able to do the job that we're doing because we often are not compensated for it by federal grants or if we, if you know, for state coalitions, I know a lot of us don't fundraise, so that there's that. So how can we generate operating surplus? Um, what we found in our state is there are more and more foundations or mm, let's say corporate grants that are actually offering limited uh, limited time for, for operating or even to help with reserves. So I encourage you to, when you can, uh, see if there's anything like that that, you're, that you can avail yourself of. Uh, there is a handout that is the Operating Reserve Toolkit. Um, I can't remember where I got it from. Um, our reserve policies, we have, a, we have an operating reserve, we have a capital reserve, and we also have a sort of a uh, reserve policy that was created when our executive director left in uh, uh, four years ago, um, which is actually to help us um, create a um, prevention program and also for more sustainability. But um, so we actually have three reserves, which is, I think, a little unusual. But what I wanted to say also about that was when Grace Mattern left um, and retired from the coalition, uh, before she left, we implemented these reserves. And at the same time, for the first time in New Hampshire, we embarked on a statewide fundraising plan. So, oops, <laughs> we didn't realize at the time that those were probably two extremely ambitious efforts um, to start in the wake of our executive director leaving. And you know, the, re the operating reserve attainment plan was for, uh, to, to you know, be at a certain level uh, within seven years. And you know, due to uh, you know, our leadership transitions, we just weren't able to even you know, really think about that until after we've you know, been sus able to sustain our leadership. So we're going to make that goal of that operating reserve probably within 10 years, but uh, you know, we weren't going to make it within seven, given the circumstances. I get asked about whether or not federal grants can pay for organizational type uh, expenses, and they most certainly can. You do want to make sure that staff, you know, looks at the the grant solicitation, but specifically the VAWA and FIPSA grants will pay for, you know, uh, anti-racism or oppression type um, trainings and and movement work. Um, even for your board, they'll pay for governance trainings. Uh, they pay for financial trainings like this. Um, I would encourage you to not use those grants for to pay for food if you have food in, during those meetings or types of trainings, and maybe use your unrestricted or maybe non-federal grant money for that. You can get permission from uh, the VAWA office, but uh, I think it's just a little easier to um, try to pay for those out of different expenses, uh, different grants or fundraising. So just talk a little bit specifically about um, expenses and you know that part of which is the biggest part of our budget often. Uh, so we can think of cost principles uh, as a cost being whether it's allowable or reasonable or allocable. Um, you can find further information from the Office of Justice Program's financial guide on specifically on cost. Um, but in terms of allowability, you want to, again, check your grant to see if that's something that's going to be, um, that you can be compliant with. Uh, you want to treat costs consistently um, across the board in terms of if you can't pay for, you know, uh, a certain person's, um, well, you can't pay for fundraising, for instance, out of most federal grants. So you, you're not going to pay for it out of one, federal, one particular grant and not the other. Um, in terms of reasonableness, the prudent person test has been long used in legal and investment circles. It's synonymous with being reasonableness, and it essentially, the prudent person is the one who has the responsibility for somebody else's money, and in this case, it's funds initially provided to the federal government, and in some cases by taxpayers. So the underlying idea is that a prudent person must exercise due care and skill and look after the money as if it were their own. Uh, mar market prices, uh, I think I saw that some folks I from Illinois were on this call from coalitions, so you can tell me if I'm way off here, but maybe an example in terms of market prices is if you're paying staff person uh, or an advocate you know, $18 an hour in Chicago, but they are 
the rate or the range there in Springfield is $12 an hour, then essentially in your office in Springfield, you probably aren't going to be hiring that person at $18 an hour. So I just want to pay attention to market prices, market prices in terms of staffing, um, you know, consultants and whatnot, and, and stay in line with that as well as not to mention staying in line with you know what your current organization is paying. And to be allocable means that your costs can be allocated based on the portion or percentage of the benefit of what it's received on the grant. So we'll talk a little bit about direct costs and indirect costs. And so direct costs are specific to a grant or program. And uh, one of the things that I think people find surprising is that my salary, a little bit of my salary, we pay for from our rape prevention education grant which is specifically um, designed to, uh, it comes through the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, and you know, to, to specifically help with statewide primary prevention of sexual violence. But we have not had a prevention coordinator here. Unfortunately, we do now, and we're really excited. Uh, but we haven't had one for years. And so I am actually doing a little bit of programmatic work in reference to that. Um, and I also spend a fair amount of time, I find it to be a time intensive um, grant to manage. So approximately two hours of my time is directly charged to that grant. It's not an indirect cost. Um, but indirect costs are important, they're necessary. Uh, there is an understanding from most folks that you can't do your, your you can't run the coalition without it. Um, so we do in fact charge the rape prevention education grant some uh, of our indirect costs, such as the insurance and the maintenance and repairs and whatnot. So uh, you want to determine an acceptable range when you're looking at indirect costs. Um, there isn't one standard that's used by all nonprofits. The next slide, I'm going to talk about some of the methods used for um, determining indirect costs. Uh, it's helpful to build your indirect costs into all your funding sources. Uh, there's very few that don't allow it, but there are a few, so you just want to make sure you, you figure out uh, which ones are those. Um, so the one of the ways that an agency can um, apply their indirect costs, such as the insurance, mortgage and rent, uh, maintenance and repairs, um, et cetera, is by um, negotiating and receiving a indirect cost rate uh, by a federal agency. If you are interested in that and you do get uh, a rate approved by a federal agency, you need to have it also approved by OBW and the Administration for Children and Families. Um, and it's applied to all of your uh, federal grants. There is also something called the de minimis rate. A uh, good description of that, because I'm not going to go into it in, in detail, um, was provided in a webinar recently um, that was called the New Uniform Guidance. Um, and you can get information on how to access that recording um, if you're interested in more information on the de minimis rate, uh, probably through Lindsay or um, the Resource Sharing Project. But essentially, that talks about it being, meaning the de minimis rate, 10% of your modified total direct cost. If you do choose to use the uh, de minimis rate, you must use it for all your federal awards. Um, it's good to develop a system, no matter what it is, and have it written down. That would be part of your internal controls. Uh, the coalition here, we've never applied for an indirect cost rate, and we don't use the de minimis rate. We generally apply cross, across a grant per the percent of the revenue each grant contributes to our coalition office budget. So we don't include subcontract figures. Um, we only include the revenue that's pertinent to the coalition office operating. So that 1.5 million that I mentioned earlier. Um, and, and so this ensures that any cost, we also ensure that any cost is allowable per the grant. So for instance, we actually have a mortgage and we're not allowed to uh, charge VOCA. VOCA doesn't pay for mortgages. So we have a VOCA grant here and we can't charge that. But all the other costs, like insurance and maintenance and repairs um, and whatnot, uh, we charge across this method. And it actually turns out to be 1 or 2 percent 
of the total grant revenue. So we're not anywhere near the 10% or, or any particular grant that would say you can only charge 7% uh, for administrative costs or 5%. So it's worked out well for us. Uh, other factors that you might want to consider in developing a um, indirect cost allocation system would be time allocation studies that you do um, with your staff. Um, the physical space square footage can be used, which is dividing your total square footage of your, uh, uh, sorry, the square footage of your a particular staff person's office divided by the total square footage of the entire office space. Um, and that's the percentage then that you would charge to you know, apply to the grant for the rent or the mortgage. There's um, copier logs or communication logs that might be helpful. And just making sure that you know eventually what those average administrative costs are for your total agency um, is something to be mindful of. Um, this new guidance that I referred to is, has asked for strong controls, internal controls regarding timekeeping, but there is less requirement for documentation of those controls, uh, meaning sort of the, the um, it was required before that you absolutely were able to document n not just charging by percentage on uh, a grant a person's time, but that their activities could be directly um, looked at and assured to be allocable to that particular grant. So I believe that particular requirement in terms of the documentation of that is, is no longer there, but it's still recommended that if you already have a system in place, it works for you to show the timesheet and how that, that staff person's entire activity is reflected by grant to just keep it. Um, we use a timesheet here at the coalition that is a specific grant, or each column is a specific grant. So I'm paid for maybe out of five different grants. Typically, it's a percentage by the grant. Um, and then we have Outlook calendars that we use because we have, we use it anyway f to manage our office activities. And so each person just puts in activities that, that particular day that they've done. Uh, typically takes us about five minutes a day. And those um, Outlook calendars are signed off every month by the same person um, that signs our timesheets, which is going to be our supervisor. And so it's worked well for us. It's not time intensive. I know that there is software that folks can use for timekeeping. And, and if they use that, great. Um, but uh, I do encourage you to sort of keep track of that for a variety of reasons, but at least it's not as quite as stringent as it was before. So in finishing your budget, uh, you want to make sure that it gets entered into your accounting software, um, that you're familiar with that software um, that will track the grants specifically, that you use that system to review reports monthly. Um, you're going to use that so that you can figure out whether or not it's time to request an extension, um, use those reports, time to request extension from funders or to move money around for a budget revision. Uh, in terms of actually changing your budget, there's a couple of theories out there. One is to never, ever change your total agency budget during the course of your fiscal year. Uh, our auditors and I believe uh, that if there is a very significant change within your organization. You receive a huge grant. Don't we all want to have that happen? Um, that has some specific programming expenses that, that it would um, lend itself to a revision budget. I think it's helpful to see the change for the board um, financially. And, and you know, just that's my theory on that. Um, once the board approves the budget, I if there is a revision budget, I think you'll want to show those two together when there's budget reports. Make sure all the staff has the budget available to them and board members as well. Um, in terms of reporting, there are uh, basically four basic uh, types of reports that you'll want to have either on a uh, monthly basis. As far as the complexity of the coalition budget, your board may not want to see it on a monthly basis. Uh, ours is not. Um, they, our board sees it on, 
receives financial statements on a quarterly basis, and for some boards, a semi-annual um, presentation of statements would be sufficient. You want to make sure that your board is trained on how to read the statements, and that can be something that your finance committee can help with. Um, but uh, the, the one of the um, strong ways that you can see your uh, overall agency position is through a balance sheet or the statement of finance position. The um, monthly statement of activities is another common report. The statement of cash flows is common. Uh, and then there's an agency um, budget versus actual report. Um, we'll also talk about dashboards, which is a much higher level uh, report um, for a board to look at and isn't as uh, steeped in financial uh, language and figures, for that matter. I did send, I, I do have a handout for you um, called Questions Board Members Can Ask About Financial Statements. They, uh, doesn't have to be used just by board members. Uh, a new ED or a new finances person might find it helpful. Um, but if you're reviewing, uh, ideally, um, each month your balance sheet and your detailed expense reports, you'll want to make notes and questions and inquire of the finances staff if you're the board treasurer, similarly uh, to inquire of staff at your committee meetings. Um, I'm not going to go into the uh, statement of cash flows because, you know, most often I find that coalition finances, and it certainly is true for the New Hampshire coalition, is very, um, it's static. It's, it's, we, we know what to expect each quarter, and so a statement of cash flows is really just received annually for us um, through the audit, and we don't find that that's as particularly helpful. Um, for our board to take a look at it, it is for them to look at a, a budget report. Um, so we're just going to talk briefly about the balance sheet and then also the statement of activities and the budget report. So the balance sheet is a, a big picture statement. It shows the financial position of the coalition from a point in time. So you're going to look at you know all assets and all liabilities and you know, the questions handout I think you'll find helpful, but y it's helpful to see, you know, how well is your cash, cash situation uh, for the organization to pay its bills, for instance, or what are the organization's largest liabilities? Often if you own a building, um, you know, it's going to be that. So it, uh, it gives you a, a, a big picture understanding of what um, your finances are. Whereas the statement of activities is a more detailed report, it has specific revenue and specific uh, expense lines broken out. Um, those are consolidated in the, in the balance sheet. Uh, the questions that you know, I think people look at when they see a statement of activities, and, and our, our board doesn't see a statement of activities anymore. They used to in years past, and even our finance committee doesn't see it. But our executive director looks at a statement of activities on a monthly basis, so she sees all of the grants and all of the revenue and expenses of a grant. Um, but so, you know, how, is, how does the change in expenses maybe relate to a change in revenue? Um, what individual expenses might have changed significantly? Um, you know, what sources of revenue have changed? Again, just it gets, helps you to see more specific changes within the agency. And then the um, agency budget report uh, is really a summary. Um, it's, again, for a specific period of time. Uh, as I said, we give our finance committee a monthly budget report, and our uh, board of directors is going to see that on a quarterly basis. Um, it's constructed similar to a statement of activities, the difference being that it, uh, the statement of activities doesn't generally show a percent of increase or decrease uh, in any particular line item. Um, we're going to show you what the coalition here uses for its bu budget report, but I know that other coalitions use um, more of a ratio-based uh, type of way to um, look at finances. Uh, so ratios may be relying uh, reliance on sources of income. So the ratio being uh, the type of income, you know, divided by the total income, and that would give you a ratio of showing, well, are you dependent on grant funds, uh, foundation funding, 
you know, uh, fundraising and, and that like. Uh, another thing, another ratio might be fundraising as a percent of the total budget. So again, you would do fundraising income divided by total income. So uh, the way the New Hampshire Coalition does their budget report is not, it's not the only way. Uh, there are certainly other methods. So this slide is um, difficult to read. So if you have the handout, um, it's, it is our agency uh, budget report. Just wanted to show you how we uh, have this report orientated. The, the first column is specific to the revenue source or the expense line item. And then the next column is our total agency budget. And then the next column is for the month that we are reporting our actual year to date, whether it's the revenue we've received or the expense um, expensed. And there's also a notation there that tells the reader that for our fiscal year, which begins on July 1 and ends on June 30th, a March budget report would be nine months or the equivalent to 75% of the expenses. So when they look at the subsequent two columns, they can see the dollar amount that the coalition's revenue or expenses are under or over of what we're expecting to receive, and also the percent of that. Um, for finance committee members that aren't particularly fiscally trained, I think this report is helpful uh, to generate discussion because folks can easily see uh, you know, where certain items are, are and ask why. Um, and one other common way that a budget is constructed that the, the coalition here doesn't do is, in, particularly in revenue, there's going to be groupings of income categorization. So you might have in your revenue um, budget federal grants, state grants, donations or fundraising, uh, fees, uh, you know, foundation monies, other and corporate. Uh, but ours is broken out by the specific, uh, like I said, type of income. So just to talk a little bit about dashboards. Um, uh, a dashboard essentially is it's kind of like a car dial. Uh, it's really looking in the big picture way of you know what's going on in the organization and, and not from a, uh, a, a balance sheet or from a um, statement of activities. So there's pros and cons with that because you know, it's a good overview of the agency's finances and hopefully in layman's language, not a lot of figures, not a lot of um, accountees, if you will. And it's one place to see progress, not multiple statements. And uh, you can use this to educate really and, and sort of empower staff and board members to understand the agency who may not want to spend as much time as your finance people might be, obviously need to be, and your, and your uh, finance committee. The cons are you don't want folks relying on the dashboard because uh, it doesn't really give the board the ability to understand the audit and specific financial statements. And once it's created, I think a con can be that you might not revise it, even though something important needs to be reflected, so you might have forgotten to get something in there and to monitor it. Uh, dashboards are usually going to have a performance indicator, a target, and a trend, um, which we're going to get into in just a slight bit of detail in a moment, and it's important to think about what elements your coalition would want in a dashboard to show the board, uh, such as, uh, well, we'll talk about that actually in detail. Here we go. So uh, just like any new system or any new report, you and your finance committee or managers want to consider factors on what is going to be included into the dashboard. Uh, so what does it matter? Do you, does your, is your board really want to know what's going on with cash? What's going on with the organization in terms of its ability to pay its bills? Uh, so y you want to agree on you know, whatever those targets are and range values. You want to decide if it's going to be just a financial dashboard or if, for instance, you might want to include uh, something that's going on with programs or if you want to include in your financial dashboard how fundraising is going as well. So you want to make sure that you spend a little time figuring out what you want in your dashboard. Uh, our coalition is using a financial dashboard and a development dashboard. They're two separate 
uh, documents that the board receives in generally two separate uh, points of time. The handout that I gave you um, is much easier to read than the slide. And uh, I want to thank Steve Zinnerman that some people have actually worked with. I know the Resources Sharing Project have, has had Steve work with them on providing some technical assistance to folks. He's uh, from Spectrum Nonprofit Services, so I want to thank him for this and credit him. And he would be happy to hear from you um, if you have any issues, financial issues that your agency may face that you may want, want some assistance from. Uh, so our dashboard um, specifically has the performance indicators, and then we have a target of what we what we think that performance indicator should be. Uh, we have ranges so that we can celebrate or perhaps figure out if there's something we need to do if uh, we're not meeting those targets. And there's also trends within the dashboard to show what that particular indicator might have looked like uh, nine months ago. And specifically in terms of our dashboard, the days of cash on hand and almost all of the other items come from our financial reports, the balance sheet, the, um, the budget versus actual report that I talked about. So days of cash on hand, the first item on almost everybody's balance sheet, it's all cash. It's both unrestricted cash and grant cash. Um, so basically we figured out that we needed to have at least 60 days of cash on hand um, in order for folks not to worry that we could pay the bills and pay the grants. Um, and then our, uh, we have our operating reserve and our capital reserve here. And again, we've those targets, I'm sorry, the, the range is actually derived from the actual policy. Um, and then our unrestricted liquidity or cash, and that term unrestricted liquidity is an accounting term, uh, which essentially means you're ready cash. So it's different from the um, days of cash on hand because our unrestricted cash does not have any restricted grants in it, such as the FIPSA or the VAWA. It's strictly for us, our fundraising and our member dues, um, and maybe a few other, you know, like I said, grants that may not be um, restricted, but more foundation type grants. Uh, so that is showing that we've been doing pretty good. We've been pretty lucky, and I can tell you all, if you heard of the Purple Purse campaign, it's largely due to that. Um, we, we actually did really well in that. So I thank our development staff and our board of directors for just really being fabulous during that period last October. The chart at the bottom of the report is um, derived from our, our monthly budget versus actual report. And uh, you can see real quickly here that both in the chart and through the figures that you know we're in the black uh, in that we're receiving a little bit more revenue than we have in expenses. Um, and so that's actually the end of our budgeting and reporting uh, section. So if there's any questions, we can take them now. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. I'm seeing something that says that uh, you can't hear me very well. I'm so sorry about that. Yeah, it's, I think it. Um, those are our colleagues in American Samoa. So we'll just uh, keep trying to um, speak up as loud as you can for them, and, um, okay. and for Alu and Flo, just uh, keep trying to connect with us if you can. And uh, there will be a recording, so hopefully the recording will be a little bit better. Yes. Well, we absolutely hope so. And if there's something that I can help them with, um, maybe they'll reach out. Yeah. Um, no questions, it looks like, Lindsay? It doesn't look like it. So um, yeah, Pam, if you just uh, make sure to keep it as um, close to your your uh, mouth as possible. That worked out really well before. And, um, OK. And we'll just keep going. Um, and again, for those of you on the phone, if you um, are on the phone but not on the webinar, if you have a question, you can press star 6 to unmute yourself and um, jump in. Otherwise, if you are online, we prefer that you enter any questions in the chat box. OK, well, it's always so interesting talking about finances. And it's even more interesting talking about audits. <laughs> but we'll do it anyway, right? So uh, you know, the best practice for charitable organizations that handle a fair amount of money, um, I would say generally more than $25,000, and I would think that's more. That certainly applies to all state coalitions, um, is to have your fiscal processes reviewed and or your books reviewed and audited. 
Um, and there is a real uh, direct difference between an audit and a financial review, which I'll explain in a little bit. But oh, I need to advance my slide. Um, and, and typically, an audit will cost more. Um, and often, an audit is dependent upon whether or not an agency has an audit versus a financial review is dependent upon how much money that agency actually receives in revenue. So the federal audit um, threshold is for any agency that receives, or nonprofit agency, more than $750,000 in revenue, they would need to have what is known as a single audit. What used to be referred to as an A133, that's, that's been dropped from the new uniform guidance. And that is related to just revenue only. Again, I would check with your state. Our state in New Hampshire, our threshold here is 500000 so we have to have uh, a, a, a more stringent audit. So we just go ahead and go with what's known as the single audit um, because of the state's um, requirements. The audit requirements from the uniform guidance are effective as of December 26, 2014. But if you haven't had your audit for your fiscal year, let's say if you had a June fiscal year ending in 2014, it, that would follow your um, the A133 guidance. Uh, for the fiscal year ending June 30, 2015, that's also going to follow the A133. And for the fiscal year ending um, in June 30, 2016, that's going to follow the uniform guidance. Um, again, there's more information in that uh, webinar that I talked about that's been recorded for you. And you can also find it in that, if you choose to look for it, in the 2 CFR Part 200. Uh, uh, so a financial review is essentially when an accountant um, comes and reviews financial documents such as the balance sheet or the statement of cash flows, uh, ledgers you might have, you know, payroll general, general ledgers and whatnot. And then that accountant will um, write up a statement or a report on what they find in their review and of those financial documents. An audit is a much more extensive process. Again, it's going to follow those uh, requirements that are handed down from the Code of Federal Re Regulations. Um, the auditor is going to look at your books in detail, your accounting systems, your internal controls, all the practices that you have in place, and they're going to provide a lengthy opinion on those um, financial systems. There's two phases to this type of audit, and that's one is planning and one is the um, on-site. So in reference to the planning phase, the auditors are going to ask you for documents uh, such as, like I said, your check register, your general ledger, payroll ledgers, copies of your contracts, your grant awards, your bank reconciliations, just quite, quite a list. And you can generally provide those via email. And this is going to help your auditor to determine what they're going to look at or sample, if you will. That's a term you'll, you'll hear a lot with auditors. Um, to determine what they're going to look at on the on-site visit, or what's also known as the field portion of the audit. Um, the on-site, uh, the auditor is going to ask for those documents that they hopefully maybe will have provided you a list ahead of time so that you can pull them and you'll have them ready for the auditor when they come. Usually those are going to be um, timesheets or accounts payable um, approvals. Uh, they may ask for reports to be generated on the spot. We've actually had auditors ask to watch, <laughs> you know, look into our accounting system while those reports are being generated. I think they're looking to see how easy it is for staff to manage the information that's requested. Uh, after they visit, they're going to provide you with a draft audited financial statement. That's going to include their um, balance sheet as of the end of your fiscal year, and statement of activities and statement of cash flows. Um, and I want to say to you all that you are hiring this auditor, whether it's a person who's doing a financial review or an auditor, and they're working for you. And even while they're checking for certain specific activities, processes to be conducted according to generally accepted accounting principles, they needn't overburden you or your staff to do so. So we found that an organized auditor will be on site for us no more than two days. 
and just want to say again that we are managing 20 contracts, most of them federal, uh, with a lot of those uh, grants being subcontracted. So still, we're only looking at two days or less. We find that the draft audit statements that the auditor emails back to us are done within three weeks or so from the time that they were here on site. And we'll provide feedback to those um, documents that they provide to us to the auditors. They may ask us a few questions, but it doesn't drag on with them asking question after question. Um, I understand that you know if you've got an inspector general um, audit, that's different, and that may unfortunately drag on a little longer than what would be you know this annual audit. But if if you do find that this is happening, I think two things are occurring, and that's one: there may be a problem with your books, or maybe your processes, and or the auditor doesn't really fully understand their purpose and or their state and federal requirements. So I think it's really it, it, you should feel free to inquire with the auditor as to why it's dragging on or specifically what is happening with that. Um, and then once the uh, auditor submits the final audit to you, it can be presented to your board for approval. Well, one thing that happened that was interesting recently was an auditor that we have had since 2011. So you know, they say best practices to change an auditor Sometime it could be within three years, it could be within seven years. But so we changed our auditor in uh, 2011, and they provided us with a letter that was a peer review. It was the New England peer review. So I'm not sure there is a is a uh, peer review of the ilk in the part of the country that you're at, but it was from the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. And what it was was from this. New England Peer Review saying that our auditors, processes, um, and documents were um, within, you know, generally accepted accounting principles, and you know their their uh, engagements um, were performed against or under the government auditing standards. So, if you are in the process of changing audits, auditors, or even if you're not, you can maybe inquire as to whether or not. There has been a peer review done of, of those folks and, and see what that looks like. Um, so there is language that is commonly referred to in an audit that says, oh, we've got a clean audit. Uh, and actually, it's real language in the audit which states that your uh, statements are unqualified. And what that means is that the auditor didn't have to qualify something. They didn't have to say, oh, you know, the coalition's process for handling internal controls in this area you know, is, is deficient or, or something along those lines. So if you see the language unqualified, you've got a really great audit. Um, similar language is going to state things like the statement of financial position is fairly representative of the organization's position, and the internal controls um, are that the, the reader of the statements are confident the internal controls have been followed and appropriate accounting principles have been used and are consistent. Um, so that's something that you're going to receive in an audit is very specific language that says that all processes were compliant with uh, generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, in terms of if folks have ever heard of a management letter or uh, I can't remember another term that I've heard of that is a document that's submitted along with the audited financial statements, and it's typically been a place for the auditor to write about something they noticed financially or a process that could be improved. Um, I've heard people tell me that their auditors have said, oh, they always uh, submit a management letter, or you have to have one, and that's not true. Um, our coalition hasn't had a management letter in years, and um, we've been considered there's these designations of low risk, medium risk, and high risk as an oddity, and we've been considered a low risk oddity. So I just would also caution you if, if maybe uh, the auditor is you know, charging more for a management letter or there's things in the management letter that you think really don't rise to the level of something along those lines. So I'm actually done. Um, I, I wanted to make sure that you knew that um, the PowerPoint, which I believe is one of your handouts, has some resources that I've used throughout the years. 
um, here. I, I want to make sure that um, I give credit to the National Network to End Domestic Violence and the Resource Sharing Project because throughout the years they've been helpful to me and our coalition. And wanted just to remind you that you know it can take months or even years to review your financial systems and revise to best practice models. And as long as you keep plugging away at it, then I think you can be considered a success and just practicing good financial practice. Um, so I want to say thank you very much and um, open this up to questions. Great. Thank you so much, Pam. Um, I have a question I think it's directed to me that I, if I will be sending out the PowerPoint slides, I do have a PDF of the PowerPoint. So um, I will be sending that out. Hopefully it will be attached to iLink, um, the reminder or the thank you email um, that will send hopefully a copy of a link to the evaluation that we hope that you'll fill out. And then uh, it will hopefully also include the handouts and the PowerPoint slides via PDF. So um, if those don't come to you, um, once I once I get the email, I've got myself registered to see if the if it all successfully goes through. If it does not, then I will be emailing the handouts um, and the PowerPoint slides on a PDF uh, to everybody that attended it and registered. Uh, as you know, we have recorded this, so um, I will be sending out the recording as well. At this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn.